And we're going to uh, start again, moving on to the next panel, whose topic is uh, EMR and clinical phenotyping, challenges and new opportunities. And again, with the general motif of an eMERGE presenter, a reactor, and a summary, uh, our presenter is Josh Denny. Are you there, Josh? Are you unmuted, Josh? Are you I'm unmuted, unmuted Josh? Josh. <laughs> Ah, great. Can you hear me now? Okay, now we can hear you. Yay. Great. I was muted by the organizer, which, you know, you're not able to unmute yourself, I think, um, at that point. So, um, Brandy, why don't you just drive the slides? And uh, at some of these slides are going to be a, a kind of a rehash of what has already been presented, so I'll go through them quickly, and, uh, and then we can move on. So, um, Brandy, why don't you go ahead and advance? Next slide. So this comes from our original charter, uh, condensed a little bit. Um, for our goals were to develop, validate, and implement about 27 EHR phenotypes, which would bring the total between eMERGE 1 and eMERGE 2 to over 40 um, for genomic study across eMERGE sites. In addition, the total gets a little bit larger when you think of things like hemochromatosis and, and uh, other projects that have been engaged. Um, the model for each phenotype was that there would be a lead site that develops it and validates it. Um, one to two other sites to deploy, uh, validate, revise the algorithm uh, with their lessons, and then deploy across the network. And uh, Emerge 2 used the model that everything used existing genotype records um, as opposed to using uh, specific cohorts as done in Emerge 1. Um, and then of course, we wanted to investigate you know, ways to preserve privacy, promote data algorithm reuse across the network and, and amongst other sites. Um, and then the second goal was to uh, improve the process of EHR phenotyping. And we, we had this uh, wrinkle that we, you know, were thinking about implementation here, too. And uh, as we've gotten into the eMERGE PGX project, uh, things where it might actually get into clinical care. Next slide. So this just summarizes where we are um, now. Um, the three colors here represent where we are. Um, the uh, what was originally, I think, greenish on my screen, looks a little different now, represents phenotypes that have been done um, really with GWAS uh, at various stages of completion now. Uh, the, the, uh, you can see the uh, kind of the yellowish color, the um, phenotypes that are expected to be uh, done next, and then the others in development. So we're making good progress on the specific eMERGE2 phenotypes. There have been some phenotypes that have been explored um, in addition to this set. Uh, through uh, some cases even more formal um, algorithms and validation um, that then were uh, realized to be not feasible. So part of the process, I think, is an investigation process and then revision as needed uh, to um, uh, see which phenotypes actually can be done. Next slide. Overall, what we've learned is, is there can be summarized as four important parts to a phenotype algorithm to get an accurate case um, and control uh, uh, algorithms. And uh, they usually almost all include billing codes of some sort as a necessary um, uh, but not sufficient first step. And then validation of those billing codes with things like medication data, lab and test result data, and then clinical note data. And uh, sometimes we use, um, employ various degrees of natural language processing. We may use um, text mining. Uh, uh, Rex mentioned um, we've done some investigation into machine learning techniques and active learning as well um, for specific phenotypes. And um, uh, you know, some one of the things that's not represented by this, some of them um, include temporal elements as well. Usually they are um, uh, combinations of Boolean logics operating on these, these different components. Uh, next, uh, and, and this was already gone over by Rex, so I'll skip that. Um, next slide. And um, Rex and Dan both mentioned PKB. Um, uh, just uh, right now, we have about 66 phenotypes that are in various stages of development. Um, 73 sites, have, uh, 73 implementation um, uh, evaluations have been um, published. And one of the nice um, components of this is it has extended some beyond just eMERGE um, as a tool for others as well. Next slide. And so this slide summarizes the uh, 73 um, 
pieces of implementation data we have on CKB right now. And so each X represents um, one site's implementation data, and you can see that we've broken out the positive predictive value by primary site and then the secondary site implementation for case and control, and the red diamond represents the median uh, PPVs in each of those buckets. I think one of the great um, things that we see from this is, by and large, the um, algorithms have performed well at uh, the secondary sites as well as the primary sites. So it sort of illustrates that transportability is, is possible, sometimes with variation in the algorithm, of course. And I highlighted there um, uh, one of the outliers was drug-induced liver injury. Um, but this highlights that you know for very rare phenotypes, lower positive predictive values would be tolerated. And I think it's OK that this sort of rare phenotype algorithm um, uh, didn't perform as well from a positive predictive value standpoint because it's feasible to review the algorithm. So one of, that's one of the um, learning points we've had as we've gone along is the recognition of um, uh, how to optimize CPV for a given algorithm based on its goals. Next slide. Um, I wanted to illustrate um, where sometimes this can be challenging. Um, one of the network algorithms from Emerge 1 that has persisted into Emerge 2 um, with the new sites running this algorithm as well as resistant hypertension. And uh, overall, the algorithm performed well, but um, in some cases, uh, the necessary data um, uh, wasn't available at a given site for the algorithm to perform well. And in some cases, there were just uh, uh, the difficulty of the algorithm uh, led to some implementation issues, which uh, the initial estimates of the positive predictive value didn't uh, bear up with closer scrutiny. And that's why you have uh, numbers like 95 going to 46% and 94 to 3%. Um, of course, we fixed all this, but um, the initial runs of the algorithms um, did find some of that. And in one case, uh, the control algorithm actually wasn't able to be run at a site just due to um, lack of uh, the necessary information in the EHR. Uh, so one of the things this highlights is the need for, um, of course, careful scrutiny of how you implement it, but also um, the uh, need to be able to evaluate your um, algorithm and potentially share it in a more structured way than uh, what we've typically done, which are um, uh, use of Microsoft Word documents and PDFs and, um, and then ways to automatically validate things like the data dictionary, um, as we've had these same sorts of problems with um, that data as well. Uh, next slide. Um, this shows the CWAS catalog website. Um, we've put all the results, CWAS results that um, Rex and Dan had talked about earlier um, on this website. It's something you can query, you can download data, you can um, graph the data, search it, that sort of thing, um, and then uh, download data sets as well. Um, and so it's another way we're trying to share data uh, from eMERGE. Next slide. This shows um, the record counter. The record counter um, is a tool we created um, at, from the coordinating center that houses the data from um, those 53,000 genotype uh, samples in eMERGE. Um, and it allows you to quickly query via things like IC9 codes, um, uh, CPT codes, demographics, and site information to see whether something is possible. That goes into filling that need. I mentioned when I show the original counts um, uh, to help you focus what phenotype to get next. And we're doing the same thing with Sphinx as well. So um, Sphinx will also have medication data in it, or I should say it already does have medication data in it. And this um, covers the data that's being generated from uh, eMERGE PGX, those 9,000 people genotyped. Next slide. So key questions for eMERGE 3. Um, we talked about what phenotypes to explore, how to make the process faster, better, how we can improve accuracy and reproducibility, and how we can best leverage the unique nature of the EMR. Next. And so one of the thoughts we had in our, in our group was moving beyond just disease gene association to more detailed phenotypes. And we think that might be something that we can do specifically with um, the longitudinal data that we have, the deep data, and a large sample size of 350,000 plus people. Um, so one of those would be less common or rare phenotypes. Pharmacogenomics to follow up on eMERGE PGX as we start to sequence uh, and have this data over time. Disease subtypes uh, that may not be available in these large cohorts um, uh, that, that collected prospectively. And then longitudinal phenotypes such as change in creatinine over time or 
development of um, uh, 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 progression of a disease state. Um, and then uh, another option, another idea would be phenotypes for clinical implementation, such as would be deployed in a clinical decision support system. These phenotypes would have unique characteristics such that they could be real-time implementable. Uh, likely, uh, you may want to optimize positive value and sensitivity differently um, and uh, uh, could help iterate in that learning healthcare system. Doing these rare phenotypes or subtypes would require bigger sample sizes. Um, they may be harder to implement, uh, may need more val manual validation, um, and uh, so I think there could be a tension between the, the number of things we do versus um, the detail that we do, and we may want to engage in fewer phenotypes um, to do so. Next slide. One example of a rare phenotype would be adverse drug events or rare diseases. Um, this shows a, as a screenshot of a, a, a case control um, GWAS on fluconazolin drug-induced liver injury where they had a highly significant signal of 51 cases, um, just showing that rare phenotypes don't always have to um, uh, mean you may have stronger effect sizes, and so you may not need thousands of cases to find signals. The clinical impact could be greater. Um, and uh, given that um, uh, many of these phenotypes may be lethal, having a prospective collection such as we have with the EMR cohort may be a good way to capture them. Um, problems could be that GWAS data may not be detailed enough and we may need new uh, genotyping or sequencing to go after people within the 350,000 people that haven't already been uh, uh, GWAS or uh, sequenced. Next slide. Josh, you're at 10 minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, so new methods as well, uh, we could expand common infrastructure phenotyping, using um, them for CDS, uh, clinical decision support, uh, machine learning and active learning could be applied more robustly. I think phenomic methods, we've talked about CWAS, we could expand those um, across the network and uh, looking at refining phenotype algorithms to include uh, possible cases and how we could capture those and include them in our algorithms. Group Health done some work on that. Next slide. And uh, central resources could be expanded. Uh, one the only thing I want to highlight here is structured data dictionaries um, uh, in data validation tools would be something we'd want to coordinate, I think, to have across the network. Um, we wouldn't want a whole bunch of standards. Uh, we, we would want to have one standard as much as possible. And I think the next is going to be the final slide. So this is just summar summarizing what um, those questions and what we stated. That, uh, uh, looking at different ways to improve accuracy, reproducibility, make the system faster, and maybe different kinds of phenotypes. With that, I will end.